on the cross for us. Thank you that um, we can come together and just share your word and to hear your truth, that we can be encouraged, uplifted by one another. And I just pray that you prepare hearts for this, that you help us to grow um, in, in, in your, our relationship with you and the knowledge of you, and that we can reach out to others and bring them into the truth as well. In your name I pray, amen. Okay, we are on session four. Thank you all who came out tonight. Um, just a little overview of what we've been doing. We've been talking about Sermon on the Mount. This is session four, but um, the last two we spoke on um, were about the um, Beatitudes. But A, their overview of just Sermon on the Mount is that Jesus is speaking about righteousness. He's come to bring the kingdom of God it's at hand, and he's sharing what that looks like. Um, he's flipping everything upside down. And the first thing that we want to look at is that the kingdom of God is about righteousness and that righteousness is about a right relationship with God. Um, we're called to love him with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength, to love others as we love ourselves. And that brings that right relationship. And then we looked at the first part of the um, Beatitudes, poor in spirit, mourning, meekness, and a hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those are the emptying out of us, that we're poor in spirit. We recognize our own um, brokenness, our need for a Savior, our need for something outside of us to change us. Um, then we mourn over that, over our sin, over our depravity. But we also mourn over the fact that what God has to offer us and where we currently are, that spiritual gap. And then meekness, um, releasing control. Meekness is power under strength, that we are accepting God's leadership in our life and we're, we're setting down our own rights and our own um, control. And by doing all those, then we hunger and we thirst for righteousness. We hunger and thirst for the things of God. We've been emptied out, and now we have a hunger. And then we talked about the next two, merciful and pure in heart. We talked about how we... Um, extend compassion and pity and forgiveness through mercy we experience mercy because he is merciful to us and then we received a new heart and through receiving new heart we can um, seek him and the things of his heart and now we're into part th three so room number two there on the last two beatitudes so i'm going to pick up on matthew 5 9 through 12 there blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who persecute for righteousness' sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when they rival and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets before you. So peacemakers is the next one. Um, peacemakers, as I was looking into this, I was just... My mind was just blown because I just think of peace of like calmness, tranquility. But when we start digging into the Hebrew, peace is shalom. It's wholeness, completeness, not just tranquility, but a wholeness. Um, the root word is shalom, shalom, which is a verb meaning to make a covenant of peace or to make amends, to restore. So what is the need for peacemakers? Peacemakers are needed because peace needs to be restored. I see three areas where peace was taken. First, between man and God. We see this in, in Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. So when the, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you? So right away we see evidence of shalom being gone. He's afraid. He's hiding himself. He's fearful. That's not peace. That's not wholeness. And then there's peace taken between man and man. So this shalom that was taken in the garden, it affected relationships. And we see that with, with Cain and Abel. Cain didn't have peace with God. He wasn't 
doing the sacrifice correctly, but instead of dealing with that issue, he, he killed his own brother. So now there was, there's peace taken from man to man. We see that in Genesis 4, 6 through 7. It says, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will it not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at your door, and it desires for you, for you shall rule over it. And then we see the brokenness between man and creation. So the world got quite bad, so bad that God decided to flood the earth. Um, it says in Genesis, here, let's see. That God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply. So that was the first command. He told them to subdue it. They had dominion over it. But now after the flood, the new command is to be fruitful, multiply. But then he says, and fear from you and dread shall be on every beast of the earth. They no longer had dominion. There was no longer peace between man and earth. In Romans 8, 17, 22, it talks about how the earth earnestly cries out for healing. It, the creation is subject to the fertility. It's under the bondage of the sin and what has happened. So peacemakers, that is the need. The, um, the need. But now there's a purpose. Why is there a purpose? So we're called to bring peace. It is important to know that peacemaking does not mean the absence of conflict. It's not to avoid conflict, but to resolve it. That's one of the biggest issues I see in our culture with being in school for counseling is that there's this need for peace, especially in marriages. And instead of resolving issues, people just hide it under the carpet. Or like we like to call it the toxic waste closet. They just throw it in there, and it just builds and builds and builds to the point where people don't even know why they're angry anymore. They have not resolved it. There is no peace in that relationship. So peace produces fruit of righteousness. When we live out the kingdom the way it's supposed to be done, there is a fruit. Peace comes from the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, which is love. When the Holy Spirit produces love in us through faith, God's work is evident through those fruits. The evidence of love in a believer's life is joy, peace, long-suffering. We don't see love, but we see the effects of it. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. So when we sow peace in people's lives, righteousness is produced. So peace, the wholeness is restored, and then righteousness, the relationship is restored. To sow peace is to bring wholeness into a person's life. Sharing the gospel and planting seeds of God's word into people's lives bring forth righteousness, a restoration of that relationship. In Genesis 5, 22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. In Psalm 85, 10, it says, Mercy and truth have met, righteousness and peace have kissed. In Hebrews 12, 11, it says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful at the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So that's that, that active peace may have bring conflict first, but the fruit of it will be righteousness. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So now we're on B. Pursuing peace and righteousness. God's kingdom is about peace and righteousness. We are to pursue it. It doesn't happen on its own. It has to be pursued and seeked out in our lives. In Romans 14, 17 through 19, it says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ is in these things acceptable to God and approved by man. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may be edified another. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. And then we are to proclaim peace and righteousness. The gospel of peace needs to be proclaimed. The good news of righteousness is to be shared. The kingdom of light is at hand, and signs of the kingdom were healing. The physical healings were a sign of wholeness being restored in people's lives. 
In Psalm 40, verse 9, it says, I delight to do your will, O God, and your laws within my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord. You yourself know I have not hidden righteousness in my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness, your truth, from the great assembly. We don't hide God's truth and his goodness or the our salvation. We share it. We proclaim it. In Isaiah 52, 7, it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. When Jesus called the 12 disciples, he gave them power and authority over the demons to cure disease, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. Number four, peacemakers, they restore wholeness. Sin that caused the lack of wholeness in people's life, it steals our peace. When we allow anger and fear and bitterness to take residence into our hearts, it takes our peace. When we sin against someone else, we steal their peace. We, steal, we make brokenness in our relationships. To restore that wholeness in our own life and the life of others, it requires steps of repentance, restitution, reconciliation. Peacemaking is messy and makes is a lot of work. It takes humility, gentleness, kindness, love, and a pure heart. The previous beatitudes need to be in place for peacemaking to happen. We have to have a pure heart to bring peace. Otherwise, we're coming at it with our own agenda. So A, repentance. The act of repenting and turning from darkness to light, that's the first step to bring peace. We have to accept that we have sinned. We need to seek forgiveness if it's with the Lord first and then with others. If we sin against someone else, we need to seek forgiveness. A true repented heart bears fruit. In Luke 3, 8, it says, Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance, and, not, and do not begin to say to yourself, We are Abraham's as our father. For I say to you, God is able to raise children to Abraham from these stones. In Luke 17, 3 and 4, it says, Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if he sins again seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. In Luke 15, 18, it's the prodigal son. He's recognized that he has messed up and that he is living a life that is not holy, that is not peaceful. He's eating with the pigs. And he comes to his senses and says, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He seeks repentance. Next one is restitution, to restore that which was taken, lost, or stolen from someone due to sin. Restitution helps restore the peace of wholeness. So if I sin against somebody and I don't restore what was taken, peace is not actually there. Um, it could be a material loss if I, if I took something that, and they lost like a day's work. A lot of times it's a, a relational loss. Trust could be lost, especially when you're dealing with marriages, if there was infidelity. There's a trust that has been lost that needs to be restored. This takes time. So with regards to sin, the restitution um, was the cost of life. When, we, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the, cons the, the consequence was, was death, and that needed to be taken care of. In Exodus 22, 1, it says, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it and sells it, he ha shall restore it. Five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. In Luke 19, 8 through 10, um, Zacharias, not Zacharias, Zacchaeus meets the Lord, and he says, Lord, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken away any from false accusation, I restore full fold. He was a tax collector, and he recognized that he needed to restore what he had taken. Jesus responded and said, The Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. C, reconciliation. So now that we've repented and that um, we've 
brought in restitution, the next step would be reconciliation, which takes both parties. For the one that had repented and has, rec and has paid the price, the other one has to forgive. So for restitution, or for reconciliation to happen, all those other ones have to happen too. The, the Lord desires reconciliation between brothers over worship. In Matthew 5, 23 through 24, it says, Therefore, if you're if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and get your gift. That reconciliation, that peace needs to be restored. Your brother may be angry at you and that anger is causing problems in his own heart and God wants us to restore that. In Romans 12, 18, it says, If possible, as much as it depends on us, we need to live peaceably with all men. And then redemption. To receive redemption, we first repent of our sins. We turn to follow Jesus. We accept Jesus' restitution for our sins. He paid the price that was needed, the blood that had to be shed. And we receive reconciliation to the Father because of him. In Colossians 1, 12 through 14, it says, He who delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed unto us the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We are reconciled to Christ because of what he did on the cross. Number five, peacemakers. So let's look at some examples of peacemakers in scripture. We have Noah. He's referred to as the preacher of righteousness. Never thought about that. I mean, there's very little we know about Noah. But if he's referred to a preacher of righteousness, it tells me that he preached righteousness. If he lived 120 years building that ark, people had to have asked him what was going on. He had to have sh shared that God's wrath was coming. They needed to repent and return to the Lord. But when the flood came, only his family was with him. Nobody received it. You see that in Genesis 6, 5 through 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Talk about peace. There was no peace. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both men and beasts, creepy things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In Second Peter 2, 5, it says, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly. Another example of a preacher of, um, of peacemaker is Moses and the law. Through Moses, God brought the law, which was instructions on how to have shalom, how to have peace. The Ten Commandments are about righteousness. They're about a right relationship with God and a right relationship with people. In Exodus 22, 1, it says, If a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, he shall restore five oxen. We talked about that before, but that was the law. God was bringing it out to show how to bring restoration between man. In Exodus 22, 5, it says, If a man causes a field or a vineyard to be grazed and lets loose his animals and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution for the beasts of his own field and the beasts of, his, of the owner's vineyard. The other ones were the prophets and John the Baptist. The prophets God sent to bring restoration, to call people to repentance. but They did not listen. And even John the Baptist came, claiming peace, peace. John the Baptist preached in the wilderness in Judea, and he, re he called out repentance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He came to pave the way for Jesus. In Luke 16, 31, it says, but he said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded through one who raised from the dead. So many people did not listen to the call to repent. Apostle Paul was a peacemaker. In one of his letters, he's actually trying to reconcile peace between two people, Philemon and his slave Amnesis, who had run away. And Paul is willing to pay the price to bring restitution and reconciliation between them. We see that in Philemon, Philemon 1, 17, 18. 
If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put it on my account. So peacemakers, the prince of peace. There was a foreshadowing of the prince of peace to come, which was Solomon. He, his name means peaceful. He was to reign with peace. In First Chronicles 22, 9, it says, Behold, a son came, shall be born, and you shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies around him. His name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness in Israel in the days. And then Isaiah 9, 6 through 7 says, For unto us a child is born, unto a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So he came to bring the message of peace. Jesus preached peace to those who needed it. Most of his time in ministry was proclaiming the kingdom of righteousness and how to have it. Many thought Jesus was to come to overthrow Rome. Their understanding of the Messiah was that he was a man of war, that he would bring action against the enemies to bring peace. However, his kingdom must first start in hearts. It was about bringing peace through dealing with sin once and for all. In Isaiah 61, 1 through 3, it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of prisoners to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, for he may be glorified. All of that speaks about peace. And Jesus is our peace. Through the death on the cross, we now have access to true peace. His death paid life for life, blood for blood. And the death brings forth the ability for reconciliation between us and God, but also between us and man. In Colossians 1.20, it says, And by the reconciliation, and by him to re- reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, had made peace through the blood of the cross. For one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, but one man's obedience, many were made righteous. In 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19, it says, Now all things are of God, who had reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And that is that God was in Christ, reconciled the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and is committed to the world, the word of reconciliation. And in Ephesians 2, 14 through 16, it says, For he himself is our peace, and he has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh that is the law of commandments containing an ordinance, so as to create to himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. So peacemakers, their reward is that they shall be called sons of God. We are sons of God when we receive Christ. We are adopted into his family through his blood, we receive the spirit of adoption. In Ephesians 1, 5, it says, Have been predestined us to adopt, adoption as sons by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So if we are God's children, there is now peace between us. We are one in a family. In Romans eight thirteen through 15, it says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. It doesn't just say we are sons of God. It says we are called sons of God. When we live like our Father, when we bring peace into people's lives, and we reflect the likeness of God, we are considered children. Children imitate their parents. We are called to bring peace like he has. When he was talking to the Pharisees, he says, 
um, that they, the, the Pharisees, that the devil was their father because their desire was, his desires was their desires. So if our desires are God's desires, then we live out his desires. In 1 Corinthians 4, 15, 17, it says, For through you might have 10,000 instructions in Christ, yet do not have many fathers. For Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son of the Lord, who will remain you in my words in Christ, and I teach you everywhere. Also in Corinthians it talks about how he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. This is Paul speaking. Okay, so that's peacemakers. Now we have persecuted. Just p- picking up on verse 10 there. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you who rival and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be excitingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So persecution, it's interesting, in, in the Hebrew, the word can mean to follow after or to persecute, which is kind of interesting. So we can either follow after Christ or you can be a persecutor of those who follow after Christ. Um, righteousness sake so we're not being persecuted for just anything not because you think something's better or whatnot but we are persecuted for righteousness sake righteousness is again that right relationship with god and others and then also we are persecuted for jesus's sake for having faith in christ so let's look at the cause of persecution so why is there persecution if jesus came to bring peace Jesus brings peace when we receive him, but not all receive him. The choice has to be made. Will we follow him or will we persecute against him? We must receive Jesus and we must and what he has to offer on his terms, not our own. So the first part of the cause is the clash. It is between those who are pursuing the kingdom of God and those who are not. Those who are seeking to live out the Beatitudes and those who resist it. Those who live in light versus those who are in darkness. Those who seek God's way and not man's tradition. Persecution comes from believers and non-believers. We even see it in the church. When you start pursuing his righteousness in your life, conviction or, and it can convict other people who are not pursuing it. And they can either respond negatively or positively. John the Baptist is a good example. He called people to repent, to seek God's kingdom, And many followed him, but he also was persecuted. We see that in, I think I have it here. We see that when he's, um, John the Baptist is being persecuted by Herod. He's chosen to speak up against righteousness, and Herod's wife does not like it, and so she starts persecuting him to the point of death. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, First, the, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added. In Luke 16, 14 through 15, it's, Jesus says, No one can have two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one to despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. The Pharisees who, who dearly loved their money heard this and scoffed at him. Then he said to them, You like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your heart. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. The other reason that there is persecution is because there are hard hearts. Darkness hardens our heart. It blinds people to the truth. Hard hearts resist truth and righteousness. God calls his people to circumcise their heart, to not resist him. In scripture, those who have hard hearts are often referred to as stiff-necked. They're unyielding to God's word. In Luke 8, 4 through 8, it says, And when a great multitude had gathered, they had come to him from every city. He spoke to a parable. A sower went out and sowed his seed, and he sowed some, and it fell on the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rocks. As soon as it sprung up, it withered away because of lack of moisture. 
And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he said this, these things he cried, He who has ears, let him hear. He's talking about people's hearts. If our heart isn't able to receive his truth, that peace, that righteousness will not, will not um, be sown. In Jeremiah 4, 3 through 4, it says, For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourself to the Lord and take away the foreskin of your heart, you men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Least my fury, my fury come with fire and burn so no one, can, no one can quench it because of the evil you're doing. They knew what Jesus was talking about. They may have been confused a little bit about the parable, but he'd been talking about this throughout the Old Testament through the prophets. They needed to soften their hearts. In Hosea 10, 12, he said, Sow for yourself righteousness, reap in mercy, break up the fallow ground for a time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness in you. In Joel 2, 12, 13, he says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. So render your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and he is relent from doing harm. In Acts seven fifty one, it says, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in your hearts and your ears, you resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. So we need to break up the heart, the hardness of our hearts. The other reason there's a cause of persecution is that there's a spiritual battle. We can't forget that there is an enemy that hates humans and hates God. He's doing everything to destroy people. He's trying to get us locked up in a spiritual bondage, idolatry. He wages war God's, against God's word and his people. He steals peace through lies and deception. Ephesians 5.12 says, For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and the rulers of the darkness of the age, against spiritual hosts and wickedness. In Mark 4.15 it says, And those are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes the word. So not only is a hard heart a problem, but Satan comes and steals it. If our heart isn't soft, then he can steal the truth. In Acts 26, 18, it says, To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Persecution. So what's the purpose? Why does God allow it? One of the reasons that it brings deeper fellowship and faith in our lives. When we suffer like he suffers, we are drawn to him more. There's something about empathy and how it draws into relationship. In Philippians 3.10, it says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being comfort in his death. In 2 Corinthians 12.10, it says, That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, insult, and hardship, and persecution, and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. B, it also produces, produces maturity and love in us. God allows testing in our lives and persecution because in those trials, it tests our faith. It helps us to see how deep or how shallow our faith is. It removes the things that hinder love. In Romans 5, 3 through 5, it says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. And now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall in various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that it may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. The other reason that God allows persecution is that it brings him glory. When those who love him face persecution, God uses it to reveal himself and bring himself glory. It opens eyes of the blind and draws people to the Lord. When people are willing to die for what they believe in, it speaks volume. I think of Shadmach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were being persecuted by the king because they would not bow down to him. So he throws them in the fire. And let's pick up on verse 28. It says, Nebuchadnezzar says, 
Blessed is the God of Shadmach, Reshach, and Abednego who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. So they're in this fire, and all of a sudden there's a fourth in the fire. God rescued them. I'm not saying that anytime you're persecuted, you will be rescued. Sometimes death does happen. But in this instance, God decided to save them and glorify himself. In Acts 16, 25 through 30, it says, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosened. And the doorkeeper of the prisoner, awaking from his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called out in a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought, and he brought them out and said, Sir, what do I need to do to be saved? So them being persecuted and thrown in a prison brought someone to the Lord. God was glorified. And 1 Peter 4.14 says, If you are reproached for men of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of the glory of God rests upon you. On their parts he is blasphemy, but on your part he is glorified. The other reason that persecution comes is it spreads the gospel. Persecution came in Jerusalem in the first part of the church, and it helped spread the gospel out farther. In Acts 8.1 it says, Now Saul was consisting, consenting to his death, and at this time a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So persecution, what is our response when we are persecuted? One, we shouldn't be surprised. The word is clear that we will be hated as we follow Christ. Jesus warned everyone that, if they, um, that they would be persecuted. If, um, if we live out Jesus' value system against the world, there is going to be persecution. In John 15, 19 through 20, it says, If you are, were of the world, the world loves its own. Yet you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Remember that the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If, I, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all those things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. And in Matthew 24, 9 through 12, it says, Then they were, will deliver you to the tribulation and will kill you. And they will be, you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And that many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. And in 2 Timothy 3, 12, it says, Yes, and all who desire to live God." To live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. We're also called not to be offended. We, can, we, can, we don't want to take it personal. We have to remind ourselves that when we're being persecuted, it's not about us. It's about living out the life that Jesus has called us to lo- do. It's that clashing of systems, those values. In John seven twenty two through 23, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised, the poor have been um, preached the gospel to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. We're also called to endure. If we praise persecution and revival, we are called to endure it. Our endurance and patience will be rewarded. In Matthew 10, 22, it says, And you will be hated by all men, but for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. In 1 Corinthians 4, 12, and 13, it says, And we labor, working with our hands, being rivaled, and we, bl- we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defeated, we enter. We have been made as the filth of the world, the offspring of the things un- at, until now. And in 2 uh, Thess- Thessalonians 1, 4 through 5, it says, So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of our God, for your patience and faith and all your persecution and tribulation that you endured, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom for which you have suffered. And we are called to bless and not curse people. 
We are instructed to bless those who persecute us, to show them love, to overcome evil with good, and to pray for them. In Matthew 5, verse 43 through 45, it says, And you've heard what it is said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. In Romans 12, 12 through 14, it says, Rejoice in hope, patience in tribulation, continuing steadfast in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, giving to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse. In Romans 12, 20 through 21, it says, Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire in his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So let's look at some uh, examples of persecution in the Bible. We got excuse me, the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 18, 11 through 12 and 18 says, Now therefore speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster and devising a plan against you. Return now every one from his evil ways and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, That is hopeless. So we will walk according to our plans and we will every one obey the dictations of our evil hearts. Then they said, Come and let us deceive a plan against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priests, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us attack him with our tongues, and let us not give heed to any of his words. They loved the evilness in their own heart more. They did not want to repent, and they planned to persecute and to kill him. The prophet Daniel is another example. In Daniel 6, starting in verse 3, it says, Then Daniel distinguished himself above the governors because of the excellent spirit was on him and the king gave those to setting him over the he was gave thought to setting him over the whole realm so the governors and the shrimps sought to find some charge against daniel concealing the concerning the kingdom but they could find no charge against or fault because he was faithful nor was there any error or fault found in him these men said, we shall not find any charge against Daniel unless we find against his concerning the law of his God. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before God. So there was a, a decree laid out that you could only bow down to the king. They knew by doing that that Daniel would break that law. So the king came, gave the command, and they brought Daniel and casted him into the dens of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. And then here's the John the Baptist one. For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So she plotted to kill him because he stood against what she was doing. He stood for righteousness. And then the apostles in the early church faced persecution. We see Acts 5, 40 through 42. And they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they condemned them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And in daily in the temple and in the house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And then Acts 7, 54 through 57, he says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gashed their teeth, gashed at him their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God, Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and said, Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then he cried out with a loud voice, stopping their ears, and, ran, stopping their ears, and they ran at him at one accord. So basically, this is the story of Stephen. He's sharing the gospel, and they don't like what they're hearing. And so they, at one accord, they decide to kill him. But he saw Jesus stand up. Jesus stood up with him as he stood for him. In 2 Corinthians 11, 20 through 25, it says, And they ministered of Christ. I speak as a fuel, a fuel, a fool. I can't speak today. 
I am more in labor, more abundantly, in stripes above measure, in prison more frequently, in death often. For the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. This is Paul talking about all that he had endured for Christ. And then persecution, the man of sorrow, Jesus himself. So the plan was that Jesus would come and die, that he would be persecuted. That was the plan. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And he was hid, and, and as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and would, did not esteem him. And in Matthew 10:34 it says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. And then the plot. The Pharisees plotted to kill Jesus because they preferred their way of life. They didn't like the Messiah that was before him, before them. That's not what they wanted. In John 11, 46 to 40, it says, But some went to the Pharisees and told them that Jesus had done. And then leading the priests and the Pharisees called to the high council, what are we going to do? They asked each other. This man certainly performs many miracles and signs. If we allow him to do this soon, everyone will believe in him. Then the Roman, Roman army will come and destroy both our temple and our nation. And so the pattern. We are called to become like Christ. We are believers. If we are believers, we are already crucified with Christ. We no longer live. Our life is not our own. If persecution comes, the Holy Spirit will give us the words to speak. We don't need to worry about death. It has no sting anymore. In Matthew 16, 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In Galatians 2, 20, says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In Luke 12, 11 through 10, 12, it says, Now when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. We may be persecuted, but we are not forsaken. The things I have spoken to you, you should not, that you should not be made to stumble, that they would put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that we're, Whoever kills you will think that they, he offers God service. And these things that they will do to you because they have done them to, they have not known the Father nor me. But those things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. So Jesus is preparing his disciples as he's getting ready to go to the cross that they too will be persecuted. So persecution has its reward. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For the joy set for us in heaven outweighs the things of this world. When we have our eyes on Christ and what he has to offer us, this world can't take anything from us. We're willing to lay down our life because he laid down his life for us. Rejoice and be exciting and glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And we also get the crown of life. In Revelation 2, 9 through 11, it says, I know your works, your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich. I know the blasphemy of which, of those who say those are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things for which they are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested and that you will have tribulation 10 days. But faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Jesus came to be our peace, our peacemaker. We're called to do the same. He came and was persecuted and died on the cross to bring that peace, that reconciliation in our own life. We too are to lay down our own life to bring peace and reconciliation. And we may, living out these Eight, be attitudes, be persecuted. That is the cost of living a different life than what the world lives. But it is worth it. I'm going to close this in prayer. We're going to have some time of worship, so just ponder and meditate on these truths. And then we'll split up into guys and girls for discussion. Lord, I just thank you, Father, that you made a plan from the beginning. 
You knew we would choose to fall away. You knew sin would come in and that we would need to be reconciled. So you sent the Prince of Peace to come to pay the price that we had to pay that we could not pay, to die the death that we deserve and to live the life we could not. He is our peace. He brings peace into our life and we, as children of God, can now bring peace into others. We can preach the the, the good news of righteousness, the good news of peace, to share those truths and to bring reconciliation to others between you and them. And then we can bring reconciliation between brother and brother. I thank you, Lord. And as we live out this life, as we live out your beatitudes, prepare us for persecution. Prepare us to endure. Prepare us to live for your glory and not ours. Thank you, Lord. Pray this all in your son's precious name. Amen.